All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It's already quite late, but we still have some sun. So thank you for taking the time uh, to come to Station F, to come for this brilliant fundraising panel. Uh, my name is Gwen, I'm head of business development for Station F. And tonight I have the chance to moderate this awesome panel with three great entrepreneurs. So I did the math, you guys did four fundraising uh, rounds, all of you uh, united. One exit, and we're gonna talk about it because this is quite fresh. Um, and obviously we're gonna talk about fundraising. The goal of this panel is really for you to also be able to ask your questions. So we're gonna spend maybe 30, 40 minutes having a discussion. I have a few questions prepared. Um, but also prepare your questions. We're gonna keep 30 to, 40, uh, to 20 minutes for your questions. Um, so we hope that you have some great ones. Uh, guys, thank you so much for being here. Um, and maybe just to get started, if you would like to introduce yourself, talk about what you're working on, uh, and also tell us how you got into entrepreneurship. Maybe we can start with you, Ajar. <laughs> okay, so uh, my name is Ajar. I'm uh, 34 years old, and uh, <laughs> where do I start? <laughs> well, tell us, about, tell us about Flitter, tell us yeah. about how you got into entrepreneurship. Yeah, entrepreneurship is quite fresh. So fundraising was the first milestone of entrepreneurship, so I can quite understand if you're now preparing your fundraising, what you're going through. It's quite hard, so that's why I'm here during this panel to uh, give you some feedback on that. And before being an entrepreneur, so it's been now one year that we are working on our project. It's called Flitter. It's a car insurance company, fully digital, fairer, simpler. Uh, we want to provide a different kind of experience to all kind of mobility insurance, starting from car insurance. So it's quite complex. It wasn't easy to pitch this project <laughs> to VC, so I will speak about it. But before that, I was a consulting uh, during 10 years, so very different kind of career. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's quite new for me now. Thank you. Fabien. Hello. My name is Fabien, and I'm the CEO of uh, Starton.io. And we are building like uh, developer tools to enable any type of developers to build uh, new product and services on Web3. So I'm sure you've all heard about NFT and, and token and Web3. So that's the, the hype to today. And you have to understand that it's, um, it changed the way we have to build a software and application. And what we think at Starton, we think that in the near future, most of the application and software we use and all companies doing business on the internet will migrate to Web3. But it's a very new technology, and um, it has a lot of challenge to build stuff around Web3, to build projects and apps on blockchain. And, um, and whereas you are a developer developing like a video game like called Play to Earn or video game on blockchain, or, or you want to launch um, NFT marketplace or build an innovative payment using crypto money, well, you will face the same technical challenge and we try to answer those challenges. Uh, about, uh, the How did you get into entrepreneurship? Yeah, so, so very early, I guess. Uh, I remember like when I was like younger uh, and I used to go in early days like with my family and uh, instead of taking picture of the of the place, the area, like I used to take picture of a concept, bar, restaurant, I used to see like our, our companies. So very, very early, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I think I've tried like a few, a few companies and uh, a, few, a few failures as well uh, to find the, um, the proper project. But um, anyway, if you want to be an entrepreneur, I guess you have to wake up every morning and say, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the world, you know, that's the mindset. And, uh, and really, and you have to, and you must have some ambitious, like a lot of ambition. And um, well, every morning uh, I wake up and I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to change the world, you know, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, but yeah, so I've tried a few projects and, um, and a few experiences. And, when, and I like this, this famous phrase from uh, Mandela, which says, um, uh, I never lose or I win or I learn, and, and I guess I have learned a lot 
because I made a lot of mistakes, but uh, you, you learn from those mistakes. Thanks, Fabien. Mathieu. Hello, guys. I'm Mathieu, the, the CEO and co-founder of Uncle. Uh, so Uncle is a fintech that is here to facilitate housing in general. So we started with a simple product that was a renter guarantee. So that means that uh, Uncle becomes the guarantor of every renter in order to help him and to facilitate his access to housing. Uh, and so we are here to secure the landlords for free against all unpaid rents. So we are working with uh, insurance companies that uh, are here to, to bear the economical risk of all of our insurance product. And so our second most famous product is an insurance for landlords. So basically the concept is pretty much the same, but it's for landlords. So the landlord take an insurance in order to be protected, uh, this time with a fee against all unpaid rents. Uh, so we do it both uh, for B2C, so in our website uh, uh, directly, and also in B2B2C, so mainly with uh, real estate brokers. So we have developed a specific tool called uh, Uncle Pro that is free for uh, every real estate broker and that uh, enables them to uh, distribute our insurance product for free. So they earn a commission each time a product is sold by, um, by uh, our platform and we earn also and we are really happy to, to do so, a commission for each product sold uh, on the platform. Um, why entrepreneurship? So I was a former lawyer. I did three years at a law firm called uh, Brodin Pratt, which is a big uh, French law firm uh, specialized in M&A, so merger and acquisition. Uh, reason why I wanted to be an entrepreneur was kind of simple. In my law firm, I didn't have any innovation and so any uh, efficiency. So th there was a, a, a big lack of innovation because the, the structure were already uh, so um, big that uh, the clients were here. And so you, you don't have the, the specific uh, benefit to innovate because you don't want to put your model at risk. And so this lack of innovation brings a lack of efficiency, and uh, for a young uh, lawyer uh, as I was, uh, it meant that uh, I was uh, very late at work, working on some uh, tabulation uh, work on uh, words uh, documents uh, at 3 a.m. Uh, in the morning, and so I didn't see at all the meaning of all of that, and I had a specific book uh, with a lot of ideas, and I met with my co-founder, uh, Cedric, which has, um, who, who had a, a really great vision of, uh, I want to work in insurance. So I loved real estate and, and clearly uh, I love it uh, also uh, right now. Uh, and so we chose to develop Uncle as a startup that is here to facilitate housing, so to facilitate real estate. And our um, differentiation is with insurance. Thank you. Well, and I have a follow-up question for you because I, I have to admit to you guys, last week we had a call to plan this session and we were asking about the different, I was asking about the different fundraising cycles and rounds that they've been through. And the next morning I woke up and I got the surprise in the news to hear that Matthew here uh, and uncle got acquired by Luco and it's not every day that a Station F, ex Station F startup gets acquired by another uh, Station F startup. So. Um, I had to ask you the question about this exit. First of all, congratulations, that's awesome. And I think, yeah. <laughs> I think that's awesome. So really big congratulations from everyone in the team as well. Like everybody uh, came at Station F that day with a huge smile. So thank you for that. And thank you. yeah, I just have to ask you like, how, why? <laughs> so he, it was just after the call. So it took uh, almost three years Three, three, three hours to negotiate and that was it. No, um, so we, we closed our round. Uh, we, we raised a, a great Series A of 10 million um, last day of October. And Raphael from Luco, so the CEO, um, sent me an email uh, maybe three weeks later to, uh, telling me, uh, hey, look, do you want to grab a beer and 
just discuss. Uh, we may have something to, to do uh, uh, with both of uh, our companies. And so we discuss. He told me uh, we have a great project inside Luco, uh, which is to build a specific team working on the relations with real estate brokers. So Luco, for uh, uh, those of you who don't know the company, uh, this is one of the most uh, uh, famous startup is InsureTech, uh, and French one, uh, obviously. Uh, they, they built great uh, home insurance product, and they do it uh, almost, uh, uh, and first of all, um, for B2C, almost. And so they did a specific team in order to build relationship with B2B2C in order, in long term, to be able to do a proper IPO. And so that is why uh, uh, they, uh, they were interested with a company like Uncle building a strong B2B2C model and also to bring uh, specific metrics and, and KPIs that were pretty good for the, for the model. So I, I think we, we will have the occasion to speak uh, uh, of it later, maybe, uh, I don't know. Yeah. If you want to do it now. Uh, <laughs> You'll probably have some questions, guys, around this, uh, this exit. But yeah, no, you're right. Today, we're, we're here to talk about fundraising. And the first question I had for you guys was really around the, um, the fundraising ecosystem that we're in now. You all did around within the last 12 months. And there's never been as much money as today in the ecosystem. Um, and the, the first question I had for you guys is that, does that mean it's easier to raise? Azure, do you want to go? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So yeah, I wouldn't say it's easy because no one, want, uh, no one of you wants to hear, hear it and it's not true at all. I think fundraising is hard. It takes a lot of time and uh, you need to prepare it uh, the right way. So in the beginning of your fundraising, it could last for two months, like it could last for six months if you didn't find the right business model, the way to, you want to speed, uh, pitch your deck. So it could take time. But for some of them, it will take two months or four months or six months, but it's always hard at the beginning. So you need to have the good tempo and the right strategy. So I would say the first months are difficult because you need to get your first ticket. And afterwards, it could get easier, but it depends on your industry, on the guys you'll meet. If you'll meet the right BA from your industry, who knows the right guy, who will get you the right intro. So it's a it's a question of chance, strategy, and good contacts. So it could be easy for some of us and more difficult for others, but it takes just patience. So it could take more time. And the beginning is, is very hard. So I think we share the, kind, same, the same story. When you start it, it's very hard. And at the end, you're relieved. <laughs> it's like the first ticket is the hardest one. And then it gets easier and easier. And at the end, you'll end up saying no to some investors, I wouldn't believe it if somebody told me, you will tell people, no, you, I won't get your money in my company, and I'll have the choice to choose my investors. That's possible, but it takes time and patience and strategy. And you mentioned strategy, which I think is, is ex extremely crucial, even before you start fundraising. Um, how, how do you get to that decision moment where you're like, okay, it's, it's a good time to raise. We see more and more companies kind of bootstrapping their stories, right, to avoid investors for as long as they can. How, like for you guys, when did you wake up one day was like, okay, it's a good moment for us to start fundraising? Was it part of the strategy all along or is it something that kind of came across your story? Fabien, maybe you want to take this? Well, <clears throat> first of all, uh, I think you don't need to raise money to um, to succeed, and uh, it's not like uh, an obligation like to raise money if you want to do a great company. So if you raise money, it's because you need to do something with it. And, um, and secondly, like you do not raise money for money. I mean, you raise because you want to have people with you to help you. So money is good, network is better, and uh, having the right people to help you, the right entrepreneurs, well, it makes a difference. So on our case, uh, we raise, uh, so like I just say, like there is um, a different like criteria. And of course, the, the timing is a criteria and the momentum and the industries. 
So for us, when we started, I mean, Web3 was something, and uh, it was the right timing to raise. And, um, and we had other like, competitors and other companies, uh, not, not in France, of course, like in US, that were raising also. And um, it's a so new market that we need to go fast, you know. It's a really new market, and um, on our case, we needed resources to hire people to make our product known in the world, to go global right away, because it's now that you will build what will be, for in our case, the Google or Apple of Web3. Because we don't have a year, we don't have 10 years, we have a few months. And market now technology, like startups, and like uh, you said before, there's never been so much money. So today you can have like company raising like hundreds of million. So um, if you want to compete with the, those company, well, you must go fast. It's and to go fast, you need money, but that's not all. You need amazing people. And this is why you go fundraising, because you want people to help you. And so you identified as the right time. So I understand time is critical. Hiring the right talent is critical. And now when we come back to the strategy of fundraising, like. Who should you turn yourself to? We know that there is uh, plenty of ways to raise money. You have like v institutional VCs, you have angels, you have alternative investment, you have public money. Did you also strategize before your fundraise what the structure of it would look like? Maybe Mathieu? Also because you did your first ticket only with angels, right? Yes. <clears throat> Actually, our first uh, fundraising was meant for one thing. Uh, we were two at the time, so me and my co-founder. And we wanted to add a tech co-founder in our team because we, we, uh, everyone told us, uh, look, guys, uh, you have to have a tech guy in your team. This is an obligation. This is compulsory. So, yeah. So, very preconceived idea. So, we... We say, yeah, why not? And we met a great guy, so Charles. Uh, this, this was uh, the, the, one of uh, our tech uh, co-founders. And he told us, look, guys, what you are doing is amazing, but I, I, will, be, I will be glad to join you only if you do one fundraising. So uh, he, he, he told us that in October. So we say, OK, let's, let's just do a, a fundraising. So that was for him. Uh, the, the first fundraising because we didn't have any money to, to pay him and he was kind of risk adverse at the time. And so we needed at the time uh, 500K. So we told us, okay, th there is no necessity to, to go for VC funds because we are just at the beginning of the adventure and VC funds will take time. They will need some metrics and we have pretty much nothing. No, we, we didn't have nothing. We have two clients, actually. So 70 euro of uh, MRR. Um, so this is pretty great metrics. Uh, and so we, we, we told us, OK, we need to, to raise a, a fund with BAs. Uh, this will be the, the, the easiest way to do it. And so 20 BAs. So make the calculation, because uh, 500K, you need to, to have almost something like 20 BAs, putting 30K for each one. So it means that if you count two meetings per business angel in order to convince him, this will mean that if you have a 100% success rate, you will need uh, 40 meetings in order to do it. So it can be easier to go for a VC fund and you only have one ticket. So this is the really depending on uh, the, the network you want to build, uh, the time you have in order to raise the money, uh, the, the person and the contacts you have in the network. Uh, we did the seed fundraising in two months and a half, uh, bringing uh, 20 business angels on the table. Uh, and I'm really sorry, I'm speaking a lot. Um, and and uh, I, I will end this, and maybe we, we will go back to the question after. And the second fundraising, um, we took um, a fundraising firm, Combo Partners. So if you don't know them, uh, go check them. They are really great. And so they help you uh, uh, get the perfect uh, round for your Series A. 
and so we raised uh, 10, um, 10 million, so it was six and a half in equity, and the rest was debt, and so the, the strategy were completely di different, but uh, this is the, the time uh, who says it all. Yeah, and just coming back on the angels, you mentioned that you had 20 angels joining your first seed round. Did you know them already? How did you reach out to them? Did you have to do any, I don't know, cold emailing, outbound, LinkedIn? Yeah. How did you go about so it? The, so Charles, our CTO, told us, look guys, it's cool, I join you, but I need the fundraising. It was uh, at the beginning of October. Uh, I did a, a, a pretty good meetings with VC funds, and they told me, if you raise some money, this will be uh, smaller for us, but uh, we can introduce you to some uh, BAs, and uh, this can be pretty good for you. Um, the first BA we, we called uh, where was um, Harold Mechlinck, uh, a great guy, so don't hesitate to contact him, he, he's really great. Uh, he is the co-founder of Ogon, uh, which was sold to Angenico for almost uh, uh, 360 million, something like that. So Harold is pretty good in life. Um, and he told us after one call, okay guys, this is pretty cool. Uh, I will put 40K on your round. And I'm really sorry, it's only 40K, but uh, uh, it's, the, it's the, the only thing I can do. But I have only one condition, uh, due to tax reasons, you need to do the fundraising before the end of the year. So we had two months and a half to do a seed round, and we only had one 40K ticket. So uh, the calculations were pretty simple. I need 20 BAs in order to complete my round. So I need at least 40 meetings. Uh, bon, Harold was pretty cool, only one. But I need f 40 meetings to do it. Uh, um, and it will be super, super hard because it means 100% success rate. So I emailed all the contacts uh, I met uh, during the, the last months for the insurance sector, the real estate sector, and I added some friends and family from uh, Cedric and I. And we met actually in the creativity room. So everyone begin, uh, began at Station F and we are really glad to, to have been there. It was really great story. So we gathered uh, two weeks later, 60 person in the creativity room. We, we put uh, a pitch deck and so we did a two hours presentation saying nothing about the fundraising, just uh, so uh, we met you during uh, our process. We have created Uncle. Now we are going to talk with you of our vision, our strategy. And if you uh, guys want to help us, that, uh, that could be uh, really great for us. And at the end, I told them, we only had uh, 40K. I told them, look, we are in the process of a fundraising. Uh, so a seed, it will be done at the end of the year. So you, you have two months if you want to, to become part of the adventure. We are really uh, half committed, so we, we have uh, 250K, so... Was you, it true? No, <laughs> we only had 40K, so we, are, we were completely naked, but uh, we, have to do, we had to do it in order to, to make the momentum and to, to, really, uh, to really be able to, to raise it uh, um, and, and to, do, to do it by uh, our time, and so, there was a pretty good momentum with the meeting, uh, with a lot of good questions from people that were uh, pretty uh, different from us and from the sector. So everyone in the room uh, uh, looked at the project and, and said, okay, the two guys from my family are pretty good. Uh, they are building a great story, so I will put uh, some money. Okay, me too, me too, me too, me too. And maybe at the end of the meeting, we add our uh, 250k so you have to create uh, a momentum so Fabien uh, to told you about it uh, and it's really great and, and it, is, uh, it is necessary for every fundraising um, yeah, from, uh, from uh, a few case to a few millions uh, yeah. of course 
I'm really sorry, I, no, I will let worry. the other speak. Just maybe, la last question, was it only convertible notes or equity with those BAs? Equ equity, we, we didn't do any BSIR, uh, so uh, we did it the very simple way, equity and debt. Okay. Um, maybe a follow-up question for Ajer and Fabien, because you both, for your seed round, had both institutional VCs as well as BAs on your cap table. Um, how did you manage to have like both VCs and, and, and BAs? Like, did you go first to the institutional VCs and then complete it with BAs, or the other way around? Ajer, maybe we can start with you. So yeah, we started with one VC. We had one meeting. Who was that? We won't name. I, I won't name anyone, <laughs> but it was awful. It was hard. Like after the meeting, we really wanted to go back to work and believe in our project again. It was really hard. Like it's difficult to start with VCs. If I could give you one piece of advice, don't speak to a top tier one VC before you have pitched your deck to your friends first, then to a BA, a second BA, a third BA. And maybe you'll do one VC from maybe not the one that you really dream of, <laughs> like one of them, but don't pitch a top VC just because you have the contact and you know him, because a VC will not really know your industry. It's something that we, we are not really aware of. You know, we are pitching insurance, and I think all the VCs that we have pitched didn't have a good understanding of our industry. You, will, you would pitch them the same way in industry, in insurance, they, they, they see people from all industries, they cannot be experts. So when you have BAs that are experts from your industry, and then you meet the same guy, and it was the same guy, he had the FOMO. When we met him again, he was like, ah, oh, okay, you're speaking to Raphael Julien from UCO. Oh, you have this guy who have invested 200K, and it wasn't the same dynamic. So if I had a piece of advice, go and find your experts, be experts that will give you everything that you need, advice, support, good contacts, and also will help you not discuss the industry with the VC, because the VC will not deep dive if you have experts behind you. So they will just do, okay, I love these guys. They're good and they have industry experts, so why not? One million is fine for me. I, I just send an email and, and the VC that we had pitched it was like, we pitched him at the very end, we didn't need them, so we started with VCs, went back to BA. We did BA's only expert from our industry, we secured 700K, and we ended up saying, okay, maybe we don't need a VC, maybe we can close our round. And then VCs started to contact us because they've heard of us, so the, the dy dynamic was different. And when they came to us, we were like, oh, I don't know, maybe I'm gonna do a small round, Maybe I don't want to be diluted. And they were like, oh, you need more money, you know? Because if you want to be big, <laughs> you need more money. So I can give you one million, and you can do more with that million. And it was, like, amazing. So the end was great after having the BA. So that's my, maybe my best piece of advice. So starting with industry experts and, like, yes. the, the people that will bring you the credibility to build exactly. momentum. Okay. How about you, Fabien? <clears throat> <laughs> well, uh, first of all, like just just to go back to the beginning, um, it's not easy to raise money, and uh, okay, so there there is a lot of money out there, but it's not easy. And uh, what, what, when we started, usually it was two years ago, and we had another product, and so at some point we tried to raise, but we didn't manage. Fin, we couldn't raise, and finally boom, we built a product and. Um, we had a better knowledge of the markets, and, uh, and for different reasons, uh, we had this first product, and, um, and when we went in production with this product, like, we had a lot of issues, scaling, and uh, et cetera, and we had to go back and build like, a better infrastructure and better service in order to build a better product on, uh, on blockchain. And this is where we find out that that was our product, and we pivoted. So we built kind of the Stripe, but what Stripe did for payment, we did it for blockchain. And so it took us more than a year before we realized that our first product wasn't the best product. And finally, we pivoted, and it was a, um, a success, if I mean, in terms of, of pivoting. <laughs> and, um, and I tell you that because if you are not convinced, if you are not sure that what you are building is amazing, 
if you are not convinced hundred percent that what the company you are building gonna like gonna explode that the product you have is gonna be uh, like uh, crazy and if you are not convinced that you are building like may maybe like a leader or, or the first in the industry I mean don't don't go for raising okay like like just you go only for raising if you are sure that you can break it you are sure that your fucking company is the best, your product is the best, huh? and you don't go to raise and say, we want to be second. You go raising and say, we want to be first. So that's the things. Then, uh, to answer your question about like VCs and uh, NBAs, where initially uh, I was like, yeah, we do not want VCs. We want only BAs. Because finally, um, like I said earlier, you, you don't want money. Like it's like it's the people you want with you. And when you are looking for investor, like they are kind of your co-founders. Like you have to understand that those people will stay with you years from years. So you need to be sure that they are the, the right people. And in my case, I had different criteria. Of course, the first one was they could be relevant for my business, of course. And the second was like, humanly speaking, like they are nice people and I had a great fit with them. And so on my side, I was very afraid that with VCs, I had another kind of relationship, you know, like more corporate, more, and, um, and finally I was wrong because I managed to discover VCs that were very like human and uh, that was very nice and accessible. And also, you have to understand that uh, raising money comes with a price, and this price is like you have to, to give account on what you're doing. So make sure that when you are raising, you are the king. Because if you're not the king, if you are raising to, to raise, well, you will have a shitty deal, and you will have people that will ask you to do many things, things that you don't want to be. So if you are raising, make sure that you are the king, make sure that you are building an amazing company, that you believe on it, and make sure that you are the right people, because then you can stay the master like on board. So this is what we managed to do. And so like, just regarding the, the point of Agile as well, regarding um, um, like knowledge within the industry, you guys are in crypto, you guys are in Web3. I have something funny. To I'm sure you have something funny to say about that. So once I was like um, uh, speaking with a, so VC, you have to know something. I mean, we are talking today, but I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm not an expert, but I can knew what, uh, what I've seen. And um, so when you have VCs contacting you, it doesn't mean like they are looking to invest, okay? Most of the time they send their analyst. So they are the first people you met. So if you go in a meeting with the VCs and you have, and you have only one or two people, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean they will invest, it just means it's the first step. So, but when you go and you meet like uh, more people and more managing partner, it means they are very inter interested. But most of those analysts, and especially in our market because it's a new market, they are here to learn things. VC contacting you to learn things, to learn what you are doing because they probably invest in a competitor. Or, or they just want to learn things. And, and once I remember I was with this VC explaining what we are doing, um, so the solution, like uh, building, etc. And at some point I explained like, um, I was talking about wallet. So wallet are your uh, digital wallet to, uh, to keep your digital asset crypto. And, um, and you have like, so instead of your bank details, it's called an address, okay? And the VC look at me and say, what's an address? And I stop from there, I say, okay, you know what? I'm not here to teach you some things. I think, I think go on the internet, learn something, and maybe we can have another talk. So you need to teach us people that understand what you are doing, of course. Did this VC invest or? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. No. Maybe also, like, uh, I have another question more regarding the unit economics of the, of the fundraising, because you mentioned that you had like a, a lot of momentum at the end of your fundraise. Um, Regarding the amount which impacts the valuation, which impacts the dilution, which impacts like the, the next milestones that you will have to reach, etc. Like, is that something that you decided before going to talk with investors, or this is something that you kind of crafted uh, along the way? Ajar, maybe? 
Yeah, I think the first thing that you have to set is how much you need to start your business or reach the next goal. So for us, it was starting a car insurance company. So we did a business plan, a, the, right, the medium one, the worst one, and the best one. And we're like, okay, what, we what we do we need? We said, okay, we need one million. We are three co-founders, so you need to be aware of how much you want to be diluted. You can't come to your co-founder and say, hey, the, the tech guy you were coding, but yeah, we have a deal here and it's 20% dilution. No, no, you have to decide. I think it's a big decision that you need to decide. Like, if we raise this, I'm okay to dilute this. And you never decide on your valuation. Like, it's just the implied amount of this, how much I need, what I'm okay to give to my investors, and after that, you just cope with it. And if you have more, then you can try to uh, negotiate with your investors. Because the more you have investors, the more people decide to invest in your companies, BAs, VCs. Then you can start saying, OK, maybe my evaluation, I can raise it a bit more. But you always start with your needs. You never start like, oh, my competitor is like valued 6 million, and they have nothing. Like, you don't know a thing about them. You don't know what they've done, what they've signed, etc. So I think it's really important to start with your needs. The, the maximum of dilution that you're okay with, with your partners, and then go for your fundraising and try to, to negotiate at the end. I know that some guys had one VC and then a second VC trying to get in the round and they managed to hire the, their uh, valuation. But when you hire, you hire your valuation, the problem is that you're expected to do more on the next round. So it's more uh, stress, more challenge. You need to go faster. So for us, it wasn't really, we didn't want to have very big valuation at the beginning. We, we set our goal and we reached it. So we are quite happy about it. So I think you, d you shouldn't be always benchmarking. I know that you, the, some people think there are a lot of money because you see some seeds like people raising six million and they have zero, <laughs> zero client. And it's the fact many people are doing it. Some VCs are investing in hype companies because they think the industry will be like uh, uh, skyrocketing, but it's not the fact. Like they, they're just trying to, to, to invest in some industries. You shouldn't try to do the same as the, these guys. You should just try to set your own objectives and what you need. And that's how it works. Yeah, and also the problem might come with the fact that the ecosystem celebrates those high valuation. Yeah, like the higher the valuation, the more we clap. And that's, it's not yeah. so true because it, it puts you in a lot of stress. Imagine you're starting with a valuation when you have nothing, no client, nobody that you have hired, and you need to hire 50 people in six months. Like, it's really stressful, and no, not everyone is for that. Like, we're not built for that, so some people manage it, and some people fail in the first year of their company, so. Mathieu, how did you go about your unit economics regarding fundraising? Uh, for the seed, it was pretty easy. So, <laughs> like I said, uh, we had two clients, <laughs> and so we proved that the model were ready to go. Product market fit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so, um, some of the investors told us, look guys, you only have two clients, uh, let's do uh, 100 and then we invest. And we told them, look guys, uh, 100 clients in B2C will be super easy. So we need now to really build a product. So two clients, you see that the product is working. So we will not uh, do uh, another clients. And so we did something pretty strange for a startup. So we had our two clients in, the, in October 1st, 2018. And uh, the, the, the following clients were in March 2019. So uh, maybe something like uh, four to five months after. So what did we do during all this time? So not holidays. Um, it was um, in order to build the best product ever with Charles, our CTO. So the first product of Uncle was uh, uh, some kind of bootstrap uh, landing page we did with Cedric. And so we, we, we knew that uh, we, we were not able to, to have a lot of clients with this, uh, with this model. So for the seed, it was really easy. 
and for the series A, there are no really uh, metrics, but on the market, uh, it, it is pretty known that if you do more than uh, 100k of MRR, then you will start to have the return churn of uh, all the VC funds. And actually, we started our fundraising uh, with uh, something like 150k of MRR. So, so we did a, a great raise uh, between the, the two rounds. And so the metrics were pretty good. And uh, yeah, and for this time, we needed a lot of this money because uh, we started our fundraising in May and we will not have any cash, I think, in end of November, and we raise end of October. So, yeah. So you knew 10 million, that was the goal? Exactly. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, we, we knew 6 million was the target, and we did it all with equity, and then uh, debt was a, a top-up that was really good. And you guys at Stardown, it was 3.8, if I'm not mistaken? That was the target as well? Uh, no. The target was uh, 1 million. Or 1 million. Uh, so how did you end up at 3.8? <laughs> <coughs> well, you know, when like, um, a VC or a business angel asks you what you're going to do with the money, you answer them, what can you provide for me? What can you do for me to, to help me? So first, do not like answer this, this stupid question. Oh, we need 500K, so with this we will do that. So you, you don't answer, you say, well, what can you bring on the table? What can you do so we become leader and et cetera? So that was a bit of the, of the mindset. And, um, and also about valuation, so you have to understand that depending on the business and the industry you are, KPIs and metrics are not the same. So for some startups, it will be the, the MR, so they are earning. For other, if you have more like a consumer, I don't know, like maybe it will be the number of users. For, for other, like, uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, dev tools, like maybe the number of requests on the API. So do not compare yourself with other business because it's different. And at some point, metrics are different. But what is nice to do is you may have an idea of the valuation because you've heard something. But what can you do is try to let them make an offer. This is what we did. And so we had an offer and we compare it and we present it to other people and we managed to hire a bit, a bit of things. But we didn't go there like uh, we need 500K at this valuation. Like we were like more in the asking the question, you know, what can you do? What can you offer for what valuation? And uh, but valuation, I mean, it's, I mean, like, don't go for too high valuation because the more, the higher is your valuation, the bigger your problem will be. So if you manage to, to raise a good amount of money at a good valuation and, uh, and manage to end your round uh, saying no to a few people and raising just enough money you need at just a good valuation, even if you see competitor doing bigger, well, you finish your round with a good round, and you know that in the coming round, well, you, you, uh, you can have the FOMO, you know, like you will have like people interested, and, and the objective and the milestone you have to reach are less, uh, less higher, because the higher the valuation, the, the bigger the amount of the money, well, you will have to deliver a lot of stuff after this. And <laughs> so. And you, you have a crazy uh, TV show. Uh, I don't know if you guys know it, but uh, Silicon Valley, you need to watch it. And yeah. there is a specific episode about fundraising that is uh, pretty hilarious about uh, all the process. So go watch it tonight. Uh, it's very, uh, very, very fun. Yeah, so I good. agree. It's nice. It's very nice. And I remember just once, so one sentence, like in Silicon Valley, you have this scene like where... Uh, where the founder is speaking with a VC and the VC uh, <laughs> tell him, uh, so he's telling, yeah, we are doing like such number of revenue. And the VC say, no, 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 no. You are pre-revenue, okay? Because if people doesn't know, like if you put a number, they will ask you for more. So if you say, I'm making 10K, they will say, okay, it's not enough. But if you say, we are pre-revenue, <laughs> Well, they can imagine like uh, a bigger number. That's in Silicon Valley. Uh, I don't know if it's the right approach, but. Uh, <laughs> 
It's a good way to teach yourself. It was funny. Um, so we, we have 15 minutes left, but uh, I also want to ask like a, maybe a last question, which is a bit more general on what you, like the takeaways of your different rounds. What do you think has been the most challenging element about fundraising and maybe a few tips and pitfalls that you can provide with, to, to everyone to avoid some key tips? Ajay, you have some? Yeah, I, I think I shared some of them. Don't speak to VCs in the first meetings. My partner is here, he's saying. <laughs> Go back to them when you have secured a right amount of BAs. Um, and second, don't think too much about the money. I think it's something like, I don't know, every, we are all coming from different backgrounds. Everyone has a different relationship with money. And when you meet guys that you don't know, like people you, you've never met, and they promise 200K after a 30 minute call, you're a bit like, after the meeting, you're like, really? Like, what I'm gonna do with this money? Like, you shouldn't care about it. You should care about your project. You should be really focused on the project first. And say to yourself, it's just, the, the investment will be just an email. It's just a promise. I didn't really realize before we got the first ticket, so just tell yourself, it's just people gathering around my project, sending emails with just one amount in this email, and I'll end up summing all of this to realize my project. So the first ticket for us, it was 20K. It was really small, we were so happy, and we didn't realize that after the, the meeting, we were like, what are they going to send? Like, we didn't even know what's a ticket. And it was just an email. And the guy said, okay, that's it, but you have to achieve the amount that you have said. And you should just say, okay, it's just an email. I'll end up having 10 emails or 20 emails, and my, I will kickstart my project. So don't think that it's too much for these guys. Some of them have task, uh, the tax facilities because they invest in your projects. The BAs are interested in your industry, so you just not have a, the same kind of relationship that you have with money because maybe you don't have as much money as they have. And that's my mania. It's, it's not something important for them, so just take these people uh, into your project. Don't think about the money as uh, an objective. You need just people who will back your project and uh, help you throughout the, the process and give you the right intros. Thanks, Fabien. And, and, oh, and maybe uh, <coughs> careful to all the clauses in the, in the shareholder agreements, uh, etc. Uh, you don't want to have any ratchet. Uh, so uh, a clause that is here to lower your valuation if you do a down south round after. So you could raise a large amount of money, but if you have some clauses that are really bad, you could end up with a really bad either exit or next round. So be really careful about this and, uh, and take a, a very good lawyer. I was about to ask, like, should you help yourself with a lawyer or is it okay to do it yourself? Clearly. Okay. Fabien? Yes. Go to a lawyer. Um, no, but she says or, something or very true and um, they are human. Okay, so you're speaking with human. And of course, like uh, sometimes like speaking like about money in our case, like, uh, I mean, when you come from like a background with no money, so of course, like it can be like uh, a bit like uh, special. But first, they are human, so they are not like uh, alien, so they are human. And, um, and, uh, and like I said earlier, I mean, to the people with whom you have a great fit, and if someone makes you an offer, don't say yes right away. You say, okay, I need to think about it. Can we meet? Can we have lunch? Can we have a coffee? Can you help me? Before they even invest. And now in our case, like we have all the investors they are, we have, like they're amazing. Like I call them the night, I send WhatsApp, eyes for introduction, and they are all very responsive. But in order to achieve this, you need to spend time with those people. So do not say yes right away. Spend some time. And, um, and uh, yeah, and one more, uh, one of the things, uh, the most important, if you go raising, like, like I mean, like, uh, 
you want to you want to build something amazing so that's why you you go for raising so they need to feel it they need to feel the energies you know you don't go oh we need this no man we're gonna we're gonna change the world and maybe just a last advice as well based on fabian's comment regarding analyst don't try to bypass analyst because then they're going to get pissed off and they're not going <laughs> to answer your emails. So still talk to an analyst. It's very important as part of the process. Um, guys, we still have some time. Do, do you have some questions? Who wants to go first? Always very shy. Yes. Uh, first, thank you for your intervention. It was uh, very uh, interesting. And congratulations for your fundraising and uh, your exit. Um, I want to know. Uh, how do you find the right balance between share, sharing information to seduce funds and uh, pay attention about uh, what you deliver because funds are often in contact with uh, your competitors? <clears throat> well, I can answer with this, maybe. Of course, like you make your research before you go to a meeting. So if you manage to have a meeting with an investor like a VC, you before check on the internet, you know, like you make some research if they have invested. And if they have invested in, in a competitor, that's what happened to us. You start the meeting with, so I've seen that you've invested in our competitor, but so what are we talking today? Why are you here? And what do you think in which way we are different? And um, so make your research first. And then in terms of like information, I mean, you know, like VCs and Business Angel, I mean, they see like 100 projects per day, you know, so don't keep stuff, you know, like say everything louder. And maybe uh, uh, just something to add to something to, to Fabien. Um, it depends also on the moment you are talking to the, the VC. If you are doing the fundraising, of course, you will need to share some metrics and some information. But if you speak to them before your fundraising, so in my case, I had discussion with some VCs maybe one year, two years before the Series A, and it was pretty good because uh, uh, our lead uh, fund, Mundi Ventures, a uh, uh, Spanish fund, uh, were a fund, was a fund that uh, I discussed with uh, two times uh, during the, the last year. But at this time, it's important not to share too much information, just enough in order for them to give them an impression of your company. Uh, okay, you are doing that amount of MRR, and maybe it's too much information, but it is important with them to, to show them that you are able to do some different steps and that you have a clear plan uh, in your head in order to say, okay, maybe I will be on the market in one year, and in one year, I think I will be there. And of course, if you, if you can be there, uh, at the time, it, it, it can be perfect for you. So hi, everyone. Thank you for this meeting. So I wanted to ask if there is an associate that have to leave the company just before the seed. How we can do that? And if there are any problem for the seed and Serie A and Serie B, if he keeps something or? That's a red flag. It's yeah. a real red flag, and you have to manage to build like an amazing story around it. Uh, actually, uh, this is a, a very interesting question. Uh, we had the case uh, he, at Uncle. Uh, so I, I told you about Charles, and he's a great guy. So if you need a guy working uh, as a CTO, uh, I will advise, of course, uh, uh, speaking to, to him. But uh, Charles... Um, uh, so was a co-founder, was a late co-founder of Uncle, and he told us, um, uh, so last December, so not this December, but uh, in December uh, uh, 20, uh, look guys, uh, I don't want to be part of the adventure anymore because uh, I'm not seeing myself in the project, uh, and I have some uh, ideas uh, to partner with uh, my other uh, associate uh, in the United States, so uh, I will leave the company. So you say, look, uh, <laughs> you're a partner. Uh, what the fuck, man? Um, and uh, so we had the plan to do the Series A two months after. And so we told him, OK, you want to leave? You are able to leave? 
um, hopefully we we have him signed uh, some papers in order to to be able to to buy back his shares in case he, he will be leaving the company. So we we bought all of his shares um, uh, for the company. So it was uh, just before the Series A, and so we were <laughs> with no CTO for the Series A, with great metrics, but with no CTO. And we told that, fuck, <laughs> how are we going to do uh, all this stuff? So we, we had a great discussion with the team, the tech team, uh, explaining them the situation and saying to them, uh, what do you want to do? Uh, we trust you uh, with, uh, with the future of the company and with all the tech architecture uh, you, uh, you, you are building. Um, but what, uh, what is your guess? Do we need to hire another CTO? Uh, do we need to promote one of you in order to be the tech lead of the company? So this was the last solution that we, uh, that we took. Uh, and we started the Series A with a tech lead, with no CTO. Um, and uh, we explained to all of the VC the, the history. So it was, uh, uh, yeah, ju just a judgment of uh, our CTO. It was not very entrepreneurial style. He, he was great uh, in uh, all of the tech architecture, but uh, the, the startup adjunctor was not really for him. And we, as you, as you, uh, as you can notice, we, we didn't have, uh, we had a lot of problems after that, but uh, we didn't have a lot of problems in order to raise and also to, to exit. Another thing as well that can be useful, even if you start your company, it's something that I did in the past, was to vest yourselves as co-founders as well. Uh, even if you're at the beginning of the project, vest yourself over a certain period of time. Uh, usually it's like three years or four years. And uh, you unlock shares as you, uh, as you stay very engaged into the project. So it's not because you are an early co-founder and that you started the project that you should get 100% of your shares um, right at the beginning as well. So vesting yourself is also a good idea to prevent yourself from having those type of situations. And just maybe something to add, uh, you have great success in the tech industry, such as Dr. Lib. Uh, Dr. Lib, uh, this was the case also. There, there were uh, uh, one of the founders who left the company uh, very early, maybe just before or after the Series A. So it's a red flag. Uh, clearly, uh, and you have to explain why, and you have to find the reason why, and try to solve the problem. But yeah, you you have to manage it. You are an entrepreneur, so so get your stuff, and uh, yeah. Hi everybody, thank you. Um, I'm a professor in a university in the United States, and I have a lot of students that come to me with questions, and they have a lot of really big ideas. This might be more of an elementary question, but what's the best way for them to channel their ideas? You know, a lot of them are trying to start a business. What would be your secret to organizing all of those, all of that creativity into one place, you know, before to, they get to that position? Well, <laughs> I can say something. It's like you were, we are seeing companies with shitty idea and growing to amazing companies. And on um, the other side, we are seeing like great entrepreneurs with amazing ideas failing. So I guess idea, the idea worth nothing, really. I think a good idea, of course, is better. But what is more important, I think, above the idea is to believe in yourself. If you believe in yourself, well, you can achieve many things. And entrepreneurship is not like a, it's not like a normal road. You will go like this, and it's really rare to start a company with the initial idea, because most of the companies that you've made, like they all change at some times. So in the the period, so believe in yourself and start the company, and then you will see if it's a good idea or not. And put yourself at risk. I think uh, if you can do it. If you can't do it, uh, this is good also if you have 
uh, some uh, chômage and all that stuff that, that can be really good. But one thing that worked really well for me was that uh, uh, as a lawyer, I didn't have any money left uh, because there, there was no security at all. So I did uh, a year without paying uh, uh, me uh, uh, nothing. And I think this is the best advice I can give to entrepreneurs because uh, yeah, you have a wall and you are uh, into it uh, at a very good speed. So yeah, you, you have to find a solution in order to, to jump into the wall and, uh, and this is entrepreneurship. Take risk. Yeah, and maybe to add something, I think your students are young, so it's really hard to put yourself in entrepreneurship. I started working for 10 years before <laughs> jumping into it. So if I could share a piece of advice, there are no age to start uh, your, uh, your adventure. So if you don't feel like it when you just jumped off your studies because your parents cannot provide uh, money for you to, to start it, or you don't have the right contacts right away, you can start working in the industry that you like and then start working on your project after three to four years. So it's not a problem to start, not start right away. And the second advice, I think, maybe join a good program, <laughs> like Station F. We, we joined the Incubator HEC, uh, and it really kick-started our project because we had uh, experts talking to us, saying everything is possible, giving good pieces of advice, and when you're young, it's really valuable because you don't always learn it in school. So you really need older people that have been through it uh, that will help you. And if you don't have contacts, incubators are uh, a right way to, to start your, uh, your uh, company. Yeah, maybe to sum up, so yeah, like testing very early on the capacity to execute, because uh, to Fabian's point, like ideas are not worth much. It's really the capacity to execute that makes everything. And yeah, creating a sense of urgency is like super important. And I would also add one thing, which is really around um, like falling in love with your problem more than your solution. There is a human tendency to, when you have an idea, you imagine a product. You imagine people interacting with something you would have built. But usually what you imagine or your dream state of your product and your idea is not the actual end game. The end game is really the problem you're trying to solve. And so falling in love with your problem more than with your solution is um, is an important one. Yeah, so first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I think I've got a question for you, Mathieu. Uh, you, ma you mentioned raising uh, funds through debt. Um, can you explain um, what was the process that you went through on this part of uh, raising money? And um, what are the pros and cons to raising money uh, through debt? The, you mean the, the timeline with the debt? Yeah, you, if, you you do, you if, if you raise it uh, after the, the fundraise? No, you, you said you uh, raised 10 million, and you said 6 million through equity, yeah. and uh, the rest through debt. Exactly. Just to understand what was the process that you went through uh, for the debt part of raising. Okay. Um, when you have money uh, committed with VC, you can go for uh, institution like uh, BPI, you can go uh, with the banks, uh, and every, uh, every institution has the capacity to follow uh, the round. Uh, in some cases, it's one euro equal one euro. So meaning that if you are raising six million, you can do a total fundraising of 12 million. Uh, so we did, we did that actually with, uh, with BPI and with, I guess, two banks. If I remember correctly, I'm not in the finance guys of uh, Uncle, um, Société Générale, and another bank. But it's not really important. Every bank uh, can do it. Uh, for the debt, yes. The the second um, the second fundraising, we we had amazing guys, uh, amazing fundraiser. So Cambon Partners. Um, so. Raising a loan or raising with, uh, with fundraiser, uh, that is a question that you have to ask yourself. Uh, in our case, uh, we, we, told, uh, we told us uh, this is the 
may be one of the most important uh, fundraise because it's the Series A. So it is really the, the, um, the pivot of all the, the, the fundraise and we need to have that uh, perfectly clear. So they help us with all the equity part and after the debt part is really a piece of cake. If you have money committed in your account, uh, you will have uh, no problem at all finding some debt. Guys, we're a little bit over time already, but um, I just want to thank you all for coming, uh, taking the time to answer questions. Uh, coming back to Station F for all, uh, those of you who are alumni already, congratulations again, Mathieu, on the, on the exit. And thank you all for, for coming today. It was great to see so many people. So we hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, you can see uh, other events on the stationf.co website. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you.